Hey everybody, how you doing? Uh, Mike Biamonti, FBI School of Operational Medicine. Welcome, thanks for uh, tuning in again. Let's see, we left off last time on cardiology. We did cardiology one, cardiology two, and now we're gonna do the third part of cardiology. This uh, video, we're gonna get more into assessment and treatment. Uh, with the first video, we did anatomy and physiology. Second video, we did more the diseases themselves, and now we're going to expand on the diseases themselves to get more into assessment and treatment. Uh, what the next video is going to be, couldn't even begin to tell you. Uh, it may be cardiac, it may not. We may go into a different medical topic, uh, kind of to be determined. We'll see. All right, a few uh, admin things. Uh, Miami, thank you very much. FBI Miami uh, just sent me this shirt. That was very nice of them. Thank you so much. Been down to Miami a few times to do classes. Uh, Good time down in Miami. A lot of fun. My happy hour went very well. Uh, thank you for asking. Had more than a few people ask me about my happy hour experience. Uh, a dear, dear friend of mine, um, sort of a rarity in the, in the sense of the word. Uh, he and I have been best friends. I sound like a kid, 50 years old, the best friend. But I've been best friends since kindergarten. Uh, and it's been that way ever since day one when he walked into the classroom. Uh, so it's kind of kind of fun. I don't think there's many people out there that can say they've got a best friend since kindergarten. But we had our happy hour uh, with his family. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Good time. I enjoyed that. Code word. I screwed up on the code word uh, last video. I didn't do it. I don't know what I was thinking. No, I hadn't partaken in happy hour yet, so I hadn't imbibed. Uh, maybe I was so excited about happy hour, I just forgot about the code word. So I'll make sure to give you a code word uh, in this class. Um, I'm not going to say who it was, but somebody actually doodled um, videos 7 through 11 and instead of giving me the code words, this is an FBI agent, uh, instead of giving me the code words, he doodled a, a picture of, of Mickey Mouse with a watch, with a knife in his hand, which was kind of morbid, on the USS golf balls. He's on a ship. So it was really, that was pretty creative. I like that. That was good. Okay, let's get into this. Um, nothing classified, nothing sensitive. Hope everybody's doing well. Let's get into assessment. So when we look at assessment of a cardiac patient, uh, there are right and wrong ways to assess a cardiac patient. Are you going to fucking die, Kyle? Are you going to die on me? Do it now! Move it up! Hustle it up! Quickly, quickly, quickly! Do you feel dizzy? Do you feel faint? Just, you can't go wrong with that. That's just, that's just classic. Classic. Uh, no, even when I uh, was in my younger years as a paramedic, uh, it's not always the way I assess my patients. I've been known to be a bit callous and cold-hearted at times, but maybe not that bad. Um, same rules apply when we're looking at a cardiac patient or a medical patient, sick or not sick. Uh, when we look at Mr. Pyle, uh, he looked sick <laughs> for a variety of different reasons he looked sick. Um, not all of your cardiac patients, whether we're talking about acute coronary syndrome, your coronary artery disease patient, your angina equivalents, all these things we'll talk about. Um, not every patient who's having a heart attack presents in that classic, right, stereotypical way that the textbook tells us. You know, chest pain, difficulty breathing, uh, sense of uh, impending doom, nausea, diaphoresis, pain going into the neck, shoulder, down the left arm. I've been doing this a long time. I've seen a lot of cardiac patients. That is the minority, to have that perfect presentation. What you need to do when you're assessing a cardiac patient, quite frankly, any medical patient or any patient uh, for that matter, but in the cardiac world, you've got to look at the big picture, your sample, your OPQRST, take in all the information, look at your surroundings. Uh, look at you know, when you walk into someone's home, you know, it sounds disgusting because sometimes it really is, but take a whiff, all right? Take a good smell. Don't make it obvious. Then it's just, that's just creepy. Uh, but when you walk into someone's space, take a whiff. You can smell dirt. You, know, you can smell a dirty house. You can smell the types of houses that uh, they fry everything. And when you walk up to the walls, you can almost, you can almost scrape the grease off on your hand. It's pretty disgusting. You know, you move a picture and you can see the outline of the cigarette smoke and the grease from what they haven't cleaned. It's pretty gross. Um, but take a whiff. Sick people 
smell sick, you know, if they're chronically ill, not to say if they're having a heart attack, they put up a certain smell, no, but you're chronically ill patients. But take a whiff, uh, you know, what do you smell? Cigarette smoke, dirt, grease, what's their lifestyle? What are their modifiable, non-modifiable risk factors? So if I have a, and I'll just use this as, a, as, a, as an example, if I have a obese, 60-year-old, postmenopausal um, African-American female with a history of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, and she smokes cigarettes, complaining that she just doesn't feel well. That's just red flags all over the place for me. And she's getting the full Monty. The full Monty being, you know, the, the, the cardiac workup, the EKG, the 12 lead, the, the whole nine yards. Now, why that category? Uh, why African-American, right? African-Americans are predisposed for cardiac disease. So they have a higher risk factor, which puts them into a non-modifiable risk factor, put them higher. Why postmenopausal? A postmenopausal female uh, versus a postmenopausal male, of course, which is, you know, big difference. Um, a postmenopausal female will feel pain differently. It'll be a duller sensation. It'll be atypical. Whereas the, the heart attack that she's experiencing may bring me to my knees. She may just say, eh, I don't feel right. Okay. Now, why female versus male? Right. Sorry, guys. Don't mean to, you know kick you in your ego, but uh, women have a higher threshold for pain than we do, a much higher threshold for pain. How do we know this? They can give birth. We cannot. It was up to the male race, the male population, to give birth and reproduce. We would have went extinct a long time ago. So we don't like pain. We don't do pain well, although we are macho and testosterone-driven. Uh, women handle it better than we do. So when we start to have this discomfort in our chest, well, ooh, ooh, you know, we, we know it, we feel it. Women won't necessarily, uh, not all the time, but won't necessarily experience the same thing we're going to experience. They may experience a sense of, ah, I just don't feel right, or nausea, or something different. And we'll talk about anginal equivalence here in a minute. Um, let's go back to our, our poster child patient, all right? Obese, uh, hypertension, high cholesterol, cigarette smoking, uh, all the different variables. That's the patient that's going to look at you and just say, you know what? I don't feel right. She could be having a huge heart attack. Now, I don't want to pull the trigger on every single patient. Oh my God, they don't feel right. They're having a heart attack. No, but you have to take all the pieces and parts into the equation and look to see, okay, what are the anginal equivalents that this patient may be experiencing? Now, that stereotypical patient we've talked about before, the chest pain, difficulty breathing, nausea, vomiting, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's perfect. You're very rarely going to see that. What you'll experience and what your patient will experience, what you'll see in the field, is more often your anginal equivalence, your difficulty breathing, uh, your nausea, your, they're just achy, they don't feel right, they have an upset stomach, uh, there's some, you know, little discomfort in their back and their neck. I've had a patient who just complained of left ring finger pain and they were having a heart attack. These are all anginal equivalents, and it's outside the box of that stereotypical pain that we always talk about in the chest. Now, from this point on, I want to dare you and challenge you as a medical provider. Get away from asking your patient if they have chest pain, because what they're experiencing may not be pain. Uh, pain, to me, is getting kicked in the crotch, uh, you know, dropping a cinder block on my foot. Right? That's pain. What they're experiencing may not be pain could be heaviness, pressure, tightness, squeezing, a rubber band around their chest, an elephant sitting on their chest. They may give you what's called a positive Levine sign. So if you unconsciously, patients will do this, you have to pick up on these cues. And as trained investigators, you're good at this. You're good at watching somebody in their body language. Uh, to teach this to a kid who's just coming out of high school, this is a difficult skill or trade craft to really teach because they're so used to, you know, being in the phone all day. Um, but what you'll see patients describe is, oh, I just don't feel right. And they'll do this and they'll have a clenched fist and they'll put it up here unconsciously. It's called a positive Levine sign as an indicator that they may be having a heart attack. So these are little subtle things to look for in your patient. Uh, patients will lie to you uh, unknowingly. They don't mean, well, a lot of times they do mean to, but sometimes they don't mean to. They'll be sitting there with the shirt wide open, okay, and they have the, the scar here from the, from the, uh, open heart surgery they had five years ago, 
and you ask him point blank. You can see the scar because I got the shirt open, right? And you ask him, you have any past medical history? Nope. <laughs> so what's what's with the zipper you have here on your chest? Oh, that was from open heart surgery I had five years ago. Oh, okay, that's kind of important. We'll write that down. So sometimes you have to pull this information out of your patients as far as your sample of the QRST goes. So the, the assessment itself is your standard medical assessment, but you've got to take in the big picture. You've got to look at all the variables. And I think I had mentioned this once before. Uh, you walk into someone's home, I'm nosy. I look around the house. Uh, I look in their refrigerator. Or I look in their freezer. I look in their cabinets, you know, not in a creepy kind of way, but just in a very investigative, from a medical perspective uh, sort of way, you know, looking for insulin bottles, uh, syringes, booze in the freezer, or, you know, what kind of diet do they have? Um, do I see a heart-shaped pillow, right, a big red pillow, heart-shaped, with a logo of a hospital on it and signatures all over it? What does that tell me? Well, it tells me that somebody in that house has had open-heart surgery, because what you'll typically find is the patient that has had open heart surgery, they'll give them this pillow to hold on to when they cough. Right? It's part of a, a therapy, a respiratory therapy, because they get this big scar on their chest. Thank you, Cooper. It's my dog, dropped his toy. <laughs> they get this big scar on their chest and it hurts. So in order for the respiratory therapist to do their job well, they'll give them this pillow to hold on to and squeeze when they breathe deeply and cough. And they'll take that home with them because it has signatures all over it. And so that's something to look for. Do they have a recliner in the living room that looks well lived in, like people are sleeping in it? So do they have orthopnea or difficulty breathing when they lie down chronically? Right, this is an indicator of cardiac disease. Going to the bedroom or all the pillows stacked up on the headboard. Do they normally sleep that way or is this new onset? These are the questions you want to ask. All right, let's get into acute coronary syndrome. And let's talk about uh, what we talked about last video and kind of roll it into this video. So let's go ahead and put this slide up. This again is a cross section of a coronary artery. Coronary artery is the artery that feeds the myocardial tissue. So when we talk about somebody having cardiac disease, atherosclerotic heart disease, AS, uh, ASHD, uh, we talk about acute coronary syndromes, coronary artery disease and the like, we talk about a patient that has something like this going on in their coronary arteries. Um, so on the top of the screen, you see very mild lining in the tunica intima of this plaque buildup. Um, <laughs> my wife is bailing me out. The dog brought, let me see the, let me see the, the, my dog brings these heavy, heavy toys in and they make a racket on the wood floor that we have in the office. And I try to hide these before the videos. He finds them. Thank you, beautiful. You're welcome. All right, my wife bailing me out again. So, on the top of the screen, we've got the coronary arteries, uh, your tunica intima is where that, that, that gruel, that plaque is gonna start to build up. But over time, more happy hours, more potato skins, more Jack Daniels, more beer, more pizza, whatever it is you're eating. Over time, if you look down to the third circle, right, you'll see that, that gruel, that plaque build up. And I'm gonna, um, you'll see that plaque build up. See, there's the dog again. I'm sorry, everybody, but what are you going to do? That's what you get for teleworking, and I'll have to... I showed you the bone before, but the slide was up, so I'll have to show you the bone after the slide comes down. Um, but that plaque rupture, that's what's going to cause that turbulent blood flow, and that's what's going to create the problem, whereas in that last circle on the bottom, now you start to see the clot build up because of this turbulent blood flow. So what we want to do is in the case of a patient who is starting to complain of heaviness in their chest, uh, whatever the case may be, and let me go ahead and put a, a second slide up here just to give you a different look. All right, so in the third slide, we have that narrow lumen of that coronary artery. These are slides that we saw in the last video. Now somebody could have stable angina. Right, they could be exerting themselves, DOE, dyspnea on exertion, which is difficulty breathing while they're physically active, which is a clinical uh, a pertinent positive uh, sign and symptom that we ask them about. But when they sit down, this heaviness, pressure, squeezing, tightness goes away. Okay, that's an indicator of stable angina. We'll get into the treatments here in a second. Unstable angina is when that plaque is ruptured, and now we have a full occlusion, a complete blockage like we have in that bottom square there. 
that's somebody who's having either unstable angina, aka pre-infarction angina, or an MI. Now, like I said in the last video, we pre-hospitally, we don't differentiate between uh, pre-infarction, unstable angina, or an MI. As far as I'm concerned, if they're having anginal equivalents, they're having this, this chest discomfort, what have you, um, and any intervention from rest to oxygen to nitroglycerin uh, isn't taking care of the problem. Well, that person's having a heart attack as far as I'm concerned. So let's go on to the next slide here. And this is the, one of the slides, again, we saw from the last video. Stable, unstable, or variant with Prince-Menzel's angina. So the top three there, normal, stable, unstable, those are the three we typically deal with pre-hospitally. We're dealing with a patient who has a chronic history of acute coronary syndrome. They carry nitroglycerin around with them. These are your mall walkers, as an example. They're walking around. They feel this heaviness in their chest, a little short of breath. They sit down. They rest for a minute. They pop a nitroglycerin. Their heaviness, pressure, squeezing, tightness goes away. They get up and they continue their walk. Okay, perfect. When it becomes problematic is when they have that plaque rupture, and now that rest that normally satisfies or takes care of that ailment doesn't take care of it. Well, now they're slipping into unstable angina or an MI, and that's really uh, when they need significant intervention, cardiac cath, so on and so on. The Prince Menzel's angina, we're never going to know if that's really the case or not, unless, of course, you have those, uh, those, uh, those predisposing factors that we had talked about, you know, very young individual doing a lot of coke or doing a lot of stimulants, uh, energy drinks perhaps, uh, a lot of what we call alpha stimulation, not alpha male, I don't mean it that way, but alpha as in alpha beta receptors from the sympathetic nervous system. If we're taking substances from nicotine to caffeine to cocaine to whatever, if we're stimulating our alpha receptors in our body excessively, we can slip into this Prince Menzel's angina. Uh, nitroglycerin could take care of it, um, your benzodiazepines, your Valium, your Versed uh, could take care of it, but it's difficult for us to differentiate uh, Prince Menzel's from an actual MI, uh, nor should we necessarily. So let me go ahead and pull the screen down for a second. All right, so just to, that was just a recap of physiologically what's going on in the coronary arteries, right? What kind of blockages do we have? Um, and these are all unseen things. We can't see this. We're assuming this based on the sample OPQRST and how the patient presents. All right, so we decide we're gonna treat this patient that's having an anginal uh, equivalent or acute coronary syndrome as it's called. We think they're having a heart attack. Okay, how do we treat it? Well, remember in one of the last videos we had talked about, uh, there's a, a abbreviation out there called MONA, morphine oxygen nitro aspirin, MONA. Um, that isn't altogether applicable anymore because we really don't use morphine anymore. It's just not one of the more common drugs pre-hospitally. We used to give it like it was chiclets years ago. Everybody got morphine. Uh, morphine has kind of gone by the wayside nowadays. Uh, now fentanyl has taken over. Ketamine has taken over. Nubane, a non-narcotic, is still out there. Uh, so there's a lot of different um, ways to take care of the pain of somebody having a heart attack. So let's go with the, the basics. Oxygen. Okay, sure. Is it going to hurt to give oxygen? No. Uh, there's always the question of free radicals. You know, should we give somebody oxygen if they're O2 sats or uh, 96 to 97% room air or not? That's protocol driven. Follow your local protocol on that. Some medical directors say no if their room oxygen saturation, when you check it, is 96 to 97%. Don't give them oxygen. So sometimes by giving them too much oxygen, we release what's called free radicals, right? If you have Oxygen, oxygen, bound together, right, O2. What ends up happening uh, in these conditions of free radicals is by uh, super oxygenating your patient, sometimes these oxygen molecules can break apart. Now you have two free radicals that will literally bounce around and cause tissue damage. Okay. You can't see it, I'm sure. To a certain degree, it's, I don't want to say it's theoretical, it's got to be scientifically proven somehow, you'd think. But this is the, the shiny object. I'm sure this will change in a few years and we'll go back to giving oxygen, who knows. But for now, follow your local protocols. If your patient is lower than 96, 97% room air, give them some oxygen, give them nasal cannula or two. That's, all you, that's really all it takes. 
Unless they are desperately trying to die on you and they're sick, then give them a non rebreather. Aspirin. Why aspirin? What aspirin does is it does not break up a clot. So if we have a clot like we saw on the last slide, we're not breaking that clot up. It's not what aspirin does. What aspirin does is it puts a, a coating over your platelets. So if I were to draw a picture, look here. This is my anatomically correct drawing of a platelet. Like it? Very nice. With platelets, platelets just normally float around, do their thing, no harm, no foul, um, unless they're stimulated. What I mean by stimulated is if now, remember that cracked plaque we talked about? Now we have that cracked plaque. We have turbulent blood flow over that crack and that plaque. Well, this sends out chemical mediators throughout the body, and it tells the body, hey, we have turbulent blood flow somewhere. Send all kinds of crap to that area in response to it because they think we're bleeding externally. Remember, the body doesn't differentiate cut finger and turbulent blood flow here to turbulent blood flow inside a coronary artery. The body doesn't care. It's going to do the same exact thing. It's going to send white blood cells, red blood cells, plasma, platelets, everything to that area to stop that bleeding and create a clot. So what ends up happening is we go from this smooth looking platelet to now, Mother Nature sends out these feelers, these spines, and that's what the platelet will ultimately look like. And under normal circumstances, platelets just bounce off of each other, they just roam around doing their thing, just waiting to be activated. Well, now they're activated. So another thing that comes along as part of your, remember we talked about the three components of plasma, our globulins, albumin, and fibrogen. Fibrogen goes to that cracked area and creates a mesh-like network over that crack. Okay, so now the, the mesh has been laid over that crack in that plaque. Well, lo and behold, what comes along and sticks to it but the platelets with these spines. Now these spines come along and stick to each other and they also stick to the plaque and creates a clot. That's how we clot. That's the clotting cascade, which is a nauseatingly complicated cycle in, in 30 seconds. So we have fibrogen, we have platelets. Platelets have spines. These spines stick to each other. So platelets stick to each other and the platelets stick to the fibrogen. We create a clot. We come along and give aspirin. What aspirin does is it creates this Teflon coating around the platelet. So now the platelets can't stick to each other anymore. They bounce off of each other. They bounce off of the fibrogen, thereby preventing a clot from getting any larger. That's why we give aspirin. That's as simple as it gets. That's what it does. Uh, it's very effective in doing that. So our goal pre-hospitally is to give aspirin, as long as they're not allergic to it, as part of your sample, you've already figured that out, but to give aspirin to somebody quickly to prevent the clot from getting any larger so that if they do have a little bit of an opening in that coronary artery for blood to get past, we're preserving that so they have some distal blood flow. If it becomes completely occluded, and that clot occupies that entire inner lumen, inner diameter of that coronary artery, you can give all the aspirin in the world. They ain't gonna do shit. And so you're already too late. Sometimes we can get it in in time, sometimes we can't. It just depends on the scenario, which is why dispatchers or communication specialists uh, within fire, EMS, police, if they have a caller on the other line saying that they or whomever is having chest pain, they'll tell them, hey, do you have any aspirin in the house? Go ahead and give them aspirin. Okay. In hospital, they'll give them what's called fibrinolytic drugs, uh, TKinase, streptokinase, TPA. There's a number of different uh, fibrinolytics on the market. When we talk about a lytic, a lysing agent, something to kill or dissolve, what they're doing is they're dissolving the mesh-like network, the fibrogen. They're giving them a fibrinolytic, so they're breaking up that clot. That's what fibrinolytics do. We don't give that. There's a lot of trials pre-hospitally on fibrinolytic care and treatment, but it's all experimental right now. <clears throat> Pardon me. 
So where we have the most bang for the buck is we give aspirin to prevent the clot from getting any larger. And then we have to get them to the appropriate medical facility, an interventional cath lab, a cardiac hospital, so that they can do a quick assessment based on your assessment in the field and try and get those fibrinolytics in early. They want to try and get those fibrinolytics in at least 12 hours after uh, an event takes place. So part of your questioning and part of your assessment is, hey, when did all this start? Oh, it started about three hours ago. All right, that's important. The ER needs to know about that. Uh, so the cardiologist can make their decision on when uh, you know he or she is going to decide to give these fibrinolytics. Once it gets past a certain time hack, they can't give these drugs anymore. Because not only will these fibrinolytics attack that area of occlusion, it'll attack an occlusion anywhere in the body. So it's kind of like degunking an old engine. You put a degunker in an old engine, you're going to spurt leaks all over the place. Our, the human body isn't much different. So we, uh, in hospital, I really got to be careful. Uh, it's an ominous thing and a scary thing, and I hope I never have to experience it. But when... Uh, you know, your loved one is laying there in bed or you're the one laying in bed having a heart attack and the doctor comes up to you and says, here, sign this. This is giving us permission to give you this drug. There's a, and these percentages, I have no idea. I'm just throwing these numbers out. There's a 70% chance you're going to be <clears throat> fully functional and fine after we give you this drug. There's a 30% chance it'll kill you. Here, sign. <laughs> what do you do? They do, they give you that same, uh, that same ultimatum uh, for strokes, too. We'll talk about that in a different video. So we give aspirin. What kind of aspirin do we give? Uh, do we give 324 milligram adult uh, aspirin? You swallow it, uh, the enterocoded? No, we talked about that in the last video. So let me go ahead and put this slide up. Baby aspirin, chewable baby aspirin. That's what we give them. Again, as long as they're not allergic to it. Follow your local protocol. You can give two to four baby aspirin. Have them chew it up, have them swallow it as soon as you can. That's, again, depending on your system, could be a BLS level intervention, uh, may be uh, exclusive to ALS. It may be in the BLS world that you're assisting your patient in taking aspirin. So when you walk in, you can ask them, hey, did the dispatcher or the communications officer you spoke to tell you to take aspirin? Yeah, they did. Well, did you take any? Well, no. All right, do you have any? Oh, yeah, it's in the bathroom. Okay, let me get it for you. So you're assisting them in taking that medication. So there's ways to do it even at the BLS level. That's your baby aspirin. Uh, next level, let me change the slide here. We're getting into nitroglycerin. This is traditionally going to be an ALS skill unless, of course, you're assisting the patient in taking it. What does nitroglycerin do? Each spray here in this example, and the next one I'll show you is a tablet, but each spray is about 0.4 milligrams of nitroglycerin. Not the explosive kind, uh, but nitroglycerin in the sense that it is a vasodilator. Now, it was once thought that nitroglycerin was a profound coronary artery dilator. And the reason we gave it to them is to dilate the coronary arteries to allow for more blood flow past that occlusion. Uh, yeah, to a certain degree that happens, but not nearly as much as we once thought. What nitroglycerin really does is it dilates the container, our body, systemically, on the vascular side of the house and the venous side of the house. We have some pretty significant vasodilation. What that does, again, going back to that formula, it's going to reduce our cardiac output because it reduces our preload. By reducing our preload, we reduce our stroke volume. By reducing stroke volume, we're reducing our cardiac output. What that does is that then lowers the work requirement, O2 requirement, of myocardial tissue. So, if we give aspirin and we've stopped the clock from getting any bigger, we've had them rest, we've had them sit down, we're reducing the workload of the heart. Now we give nitroglycerin and we're trying to lower the workload of the heart even further and coronary dilate a little bit. Now we're getting more oxygenated blood to that ischemic tissue or hopefully just ischemic and not necrotic at this point, uh, that'll eventually convert that distal affected tissue from anaerobic metabolism to aerobic metabolism, do away with the lactic acid, and now that heaviness, squeezing, tightness, pressure goes away. That's sort of the goal. Well, there are drawbacks with nitroglycerin. If you give it to the wrong type of patient, if they're already hypotensive, remember the equation for blood pressure, peripheral vascular resistance times cardiac output. So if you're dropping cardiac output by giving nitroglycerin, 
All right, plug that into the BP equation. Now your cardiac output is low. Now your peripheral vascular resistance is going to be reduced because you're vasodilating. What does that do to your blood pressure? Well, it drops it. In a little bit here, we're going to talk about right-sided heart failure. Now we don't give nitrates to a right-sided heart failure patient. And we'll see that here in a little bit. So the next slide here is the nitroglycerin again, but this is your sublingual type. Uh, sublingual type uh, by uh, what I mean is the tablet. The spray that I just showed you is, again, sublingual, goes under their tongue, and this tablet goes under their tongue. Your aspirin is chewed up and swallowed. The nitro tablet is sublingual, goes under the tongue. Two different routes of administration. Uh, it's important to make sure you give it the right way. This is in a brown bottle. The reason it's in a brown bottle is it's a very photosensitive type of a drug. And what people tend to do is they take this nitroglycerin and they put it up on the windowsill over the kitchen sink. Why they do this, I have no idea. But now that ultraviolet sun is beating into this bottle and it's destroying the efficacy of the drug itself and it becomes useless. So typically when people take this medication, they'll feel a tingling under their tongue. They'll start to experience a headache. This is how you know the drug is working. If they've popped four of these things before you got there and they didn't do a damn thing, Chances are the drug is either expired or it's been sitting out in the sun. You can see that the, the label on it is worn away and, and, and faded. These are indicators to you that this medication wasn't preserved the right way. So you may have to give them some of your own if you have it. Uh, next level to nitroglycerin is your nitro paste. Uh, this is a nitroglycerin ointment, nitrobid. Um, this we give at the ALS level in... The cardiac patients, yes, and the chest pain patients, yes, uh, depending on the patient. Uh, more so in your pulmonary edema patients, which we'll talk about here in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is given, uh, depending on your protocol, a uh, half inch to an inch on this little piece of paper that you smear, like a bagel with a smear. You smear it onto their chest over their heart. Um, you just got to be careful with this. Uh, with any nitroglycerin, whether it's a tablet or the spray or the, the ointment specifically, um, it is transdermal, uh, the ointment. So if you get this on your skin, it's going to absorb and you're going to feel the effects. You're going to get the headache. You're going to get the dizziness. You're going to get the... So uh, I'm not going to get into great detail, but years ago, uh, we had a lot of fun with this uh, when it first came out and messing with other uh, medical providers and other crews. And yeah, we, uh, we don't do that anymore. That was, that was fun back in the day. So let me go ahead and pull this down. So we talked about two components of MONA, we talked about oxygen, actually three, uh, oxygen, aspirin, and nitro. Now the morphine we don't really give anymore, and why do we give an analgesic? Okay, think about it this way. If I'm in pain, I don't like pain, I don't do pain very well, okay? If I'm in pain, what does that do to my heart rate? Brings it up. What does that do my blood pressure? Brings it up. What does that do to my possible coronary syndrome I'm having? Makes it worse. So we want to give somebody an analgesic to calm them down. When I say calm them down, it's, it's, it's not a sedative, but it's taking their pain away and making them not necessarily care about it. So if I give them 100 mics of fentanyl or whatever your protocol is, or you know, uh, two to four milligrams of morphine if you're still using morphine, uh, this is taking that pain away and now it relaxes them. Now their heart rate comes down, their blood pressure comes down. But your morphine, your opioids also have not so much the fentanyl, but the morphine had a, a vasodilation effect. So if you gave your nitroglycerin and your morphine together, you had the synergistic effect of vasodilation where you literally bring their pressure down and you had to watch it. Uh, remember what I talked about in one of the past videos. If we have somebody who's very sensitive to morphine, they have big histamine release and they go hypotensive, but their ventilatory effort is fine and their breathing isn't affected. We'll give them 25 to 50 milligrams of Benadryl with a whole lot of fluids, and you'll bring that pressure back up, but you'll maintain the analgesia. So if you're still working in the morphine world, just something to think about. So let me refer to my notes here and make sure we're staying on target. All right, we're looking good. So is your treatment going to be any different if you suspect your patient's having a heart attack? No. Nothing's, when I say heart attack, I mean MI versus angina. No. Treatment for us is the same. As far as we're concerned, 
If we think they're having a cardiac event, acute coronary syndrome, we're treating them the same based on your protocol, oxygen, aspirin, nitroglycerin, analgesia of some kind, and getting them to the appropriate facility. That's the important thing. If you take them to a mom and dad dog and cat hospital that doesn't have interventional cath lab, you're just delaying their ultimate care because now that system has to admit them, assess them, and transfer them to another hospital that has those capabilities. Time is tissue, and now you're just eating away at time, and you need to get them to the appropriate facility first. That's why it's so important for you as a medical provider to know your area from uh, the tactical perspective. If you're going uh, into a certain area to do a, to do a hit, to do training, whatever, you as the medic need to know that area. Geographically, if I have an operator go down or if I get a patient, whatever, where am I taking them? Geographically, look at your area. Where are my level one, level two trauma centers? Where are my cardiac centers, my burn centers, my stroke centers, so on and so on and so on. These are all things you have to pre-plan as the medic for your team to make sure you're taking whomever to the right place, especially if you're unfamiliar with the area. These are the you know, distances, flying time, driving time, geography, weather, the whole nine yards. These are all pre-planned events. So let's get into left versus right-sided heart failure. And we talked about this last video. And let me go ahead and put this up as a reminder. If we have somebody, let's talk about left-sided heart failure first, because that's really the one that's going to drop you like a hammer uh, before anything else. When we talk about left-sided heart failure, we're talking about the left side of the heart, right? the left ventricle failing for whatever reason, a heart attack, let's just use that as an example. For the uh, ALS providers in the room uh, that are 12 lead savvy, um, if you have a, a big LAD, left anterior descending occlusion, and you're starting to see uh, elevations and V1, V2, V3, V4, uh, these are huge indicators to you that they're having a big anterior wall MI, and that's a, that's a monster. Not to say that that's the only reason somebody can have acute pulmonary edema, but we have somebody who is complaining of chest pain, shortness of breath, blah, 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 and they look awful, right? They're sweating, but you hear them, you hear them physically gurgling and drowning in their own fluids. Um, that's acute pulmonary edema. These are sick patients. Now, as part of your assessment, you're getting vital signs. These patients initially are going to be hypertensive. They're suffering from what's known as pulmonary hypertension. The heart's beating against that resistance in the lungs, the fluid-filled lungs. The blood pressure is going to go up. They're going to be tachycardic because, number one, they're scared. They're hypoxic. They're uncomfortable. Uh, so that's going to bring up their heart rate again to a point where it's just being uh, counterproductive. So how do we treat somebody who is filling up with fluid? Now, the left side of the heart can't get this fluid out of the lungs fast enough. It can't get out of its own way. But the right side of the heart continues to push blood into the lungs because the right side is just fine. So at those of the LR capillaries is where we start to have that fluid shift. So let me go ahead and put this slide up. And this is just a quick cartoon drawing of fluid in the alveoli, and that's really what we're talking about. But now it's going to affect the exchange of gases because now those gases have to pass through that fluid. It actually also pulls the capillaries away from the alveolar membrane a little bit, you know, by, you know, I, mean, I don't even know how, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. But in their world, it's like a football field. Uh, and they, the gases have to travel that distance. So now we have a, a mismatch, a VQ mismatch. We have a, an inability of oxygen to make it across that area, that space, to the capillaries and vice versa. So it's much more difficult for your patient to have cellular respiration if these alveoli are filled with fluid. So what do we do? How do we address this? Well, believe it or not, one of the biggest things, and I'll go back to this slide, one of the biggest things is positioning. If you notice this cartoon character, he's leaning forward in a tripod position. Uh, that's pretty accurate, because that's what you're gonna see. These patients are going to be very positional to the point where if you try to lay them down, they will grab you by the throat. And they are not going to allow you to lay them down. If you lay them down, uh, they are going to fight. And if they're sick enough, they're going to go into cardiac arrest. Uh, and if you have a patient in big, big pulmonary edema goes into cardiac arrest, well, you may have to, may have to treat them. <laughs>
Sorry, I was dialing the phone. Are you all right? Yeah, don't worry about it. Doesn't look like there's any... Peter Griffin, certified CPR. Don't anyone panic. Ah! ah! What the hell are you doing? You, you know, I don't think he's hurt. I'll get to you in a moment, sir. All right, I'm gonna have to check and see if he soiled himself. S ah! Sir? Sir? What the sir? hell is I've wrong with you? Sir, I've gotta check and get see if he soiled himself. Are you crazy? Sir? I think, sir, ah! I'm gonna need you to stop me. Hello? All right? I gotta get these trousers off. Hey, 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 sir! That's sir, I've gotta see if he soiled himself. Somebody has to get right? involved, you idiot! Get off him, you jackass! Sir, I'm gonna need you to step back. All right, looks like we're clean down here. You guys take it easy. No need to thank me. Just pay it forward. One example of how you would treat somebody in cardiac arrest, but it goes without saying that that's not the right way to do it. <laughs> so how do we treat a pulmonary edema patient? Positioning, have them sit up. How bad is their pulmonary edema? You're going to hear rails or crackles in their lung sounds, and you'll hear it clear as day. It'll start in the bases, and it'll work its way up like filling up a glass full of fluid. If they're sitting upright, you're going to hear them down in the bases first. And as they get worse and worse and worse, you'll start to hear rails in all fields, right, all the way up to the apexes. Um, they will start to speak in one to two word sentences. I can't breathe, right? and they're gurgling. You'll hear it. A big jugular vein distension, hypertension. They're a mess. These are very, very complicated patients. They're diaphoretic. They're sweating. The leads won't stick. Tape won't stick on IVs. And they're combative because they're hypoxic and they're very scared. Um, one of the first things to do is, in most systems, put them on CPAP. If you have CPAP, or just oxygen is nice, but a lot of times even the face mask of an hour breather is going to make them combative. But if you put them on CPAP at about 7.5 to 10 centimeters in water as a setting, they will fight you initially. Yes, that is true, because they feel like they're being smothered. But that resistance that we talked about in one of the past videos that they're going to experience is going to create that positive intrapulmonic pressure. And it's going to start pushing that fluid back into the lungs. Well, what else do you do? Give them some nitro, nitro paste. So one of the first things I'll do with a patient who's in pulmonary edema is I'll grab their wrist, boom, 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 bounding radial pulse. I know their blood pressure is through the roof. I'll try and get an accurate BP. I'll make sure they have no allergies, or they're, they're not on any kind of ED drugs, erectile dysfunction drugs, because that's a contraindication to nitrates. But I'll take that nitro, stick an inch of paste on their chest, and take that CPAP and throw it on them. Now I've increased the container size, and by putting them on CPAP, and I'll go back to the CPAP machine here, by putting them on CPAP, now I'm giving that fluid somewhere to go, because I've opened up the container. Something else I may have to do, is give them a breathing treatment. Here's just a, a picture of atrovent, well, a butyrol atrovent, whatever. Because you may have that bronchial spasm because of the fluid. Remember we talked about cardiac wheezes in the last video. So you may have to give, at the same time as CPAP, you may have to give a breathing treatment to bronchodilate, to open up those bronchioles a little bit. But I wouldn't continue that too long. I would only do it as long as to get rid of any wheezes that may be present. If there are no wheezes in the lung fields, I probably wouldn't give a treatment at all uh, because this is an alpha, uh, I'm sorry, a beta 1, beta 2 stimulant. So it's going to increase heart rate, it's going to increase blood pressure, and it may be counterproductive to your patient. So you've done your assessment, you've given them oxygen, you've given them CPAP, uh, some nitroglycerin, you're watching their blood pressure to make sure their BP doesn't drop. Um, and now at the same time, you started the IV in the ALS world, and you're giving Lasix or furosemide. Lasix is a diuretic. By diuretic, it means it's going to encourage the patient to pee. It's going to start pulling fluid away from the patient and making them urinate. And now that you've given the fluid somewhere to go, because you've given them a nitro or a nitrate of some kind, you're pushing that fluid out of the lungs by giving them CPAP. Now you're allowing the body to get rid of it. And furosemide is also a vasodilator, so it's going to help nitroglycerin in dilating the container and giving that fluid somewhere else to go. So this tiered approach to your pulmonary edema patient is what's going to make all the difference. So I'll pull this down. So a mnemonic we used to use for pulmonary edema was LMNOP, uh, Lasix, Morphine, Nitro, uh, Oxygen, Positioning. Uh, we don't really give morphine to pulmonary edema patients anymore. What we found, and again, follow your protocol, 
What they found is by giving morphine to a pulmonary edema patient, these patients are already in respiratory distress. They're already struggling to breathe. Now if we give them morphine, that's a respiratory depressant or a ventilatory depressant. And they found more incidences of patients uh, going down hard and we having to intubate them uh, secondary to morphine administration. So follow your local protocol on that, but morphine isn't really in, in, uh, in vogue for pulmonary edema anymore. CPAP, on the other hand, is huge. Try to, if you have that as a capability uh, in your agency, or if you're in a tactical world, you're not going to be carrying a CPAP machine around with you. It's just not something you do. Uh, but if you've called for ALS response, or if you've gotten your patient back to wherever, uh, your CCP, your rally point, wherever it is, you, you do more advanced care, uh, back of an ambulance, back of a Bearcat, you may have your CPAP there. Then you start plugging it in. As a BLS provider, you can assist the medic in doing that. Um, Right-sided MIs, again, I'm not totally concerned with uh, because not to say they won't kill you. They could kill you. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's very rare that you find a purely right-sided MI or right-sided heart failure or coropulmonale, as it's called. You just don't see it very often. And it's not necessarily acute and something we're going to deal with pre-hospitally. You could see it. So let me go ahead and put this slide back up. Talking about your right-sided heart failure patient. These are patients who are going to have a decreased preload, which is going to ultimately affect their cardiac output. Okay, because it's going to affect their stroke volume. They'll have JVD. They'll have dependent uh, edema, ankles, feet. Uh, hepatomegaly, ascites, these kinds of things. But it's not something you generally see. If you happen to see it, these are patients that you won't give nitroglycerin to uh, because these are patients who are already suffering from a reduced preload. If you have a patient who's having a right-sided MI, and you'll find that uh, in your 12 leads in 2-3 AVF, you have elevations in 2-3 AVF, um, you're having somebody with right-sided MI, but if they have corresponding hypotension and possibly bradycardia, because uh, for the ALS providers in the room, remember, your right coronary artery in about 85% of your patients is what provides blood circulation to your inferior wall of your left ventricle. So if you have a very high occlusion in your RCA, well, that RCA also provides blood to your SA node. So now if you have a very high occlusion and you have decreased blood flow to your SA node, you're affecting the entire right side of the heart and the inferior wall of the left ventricle. So not only are you going to have a rate problem because your SA node is affected, but you can have a preload problem. So your patient's going to be borderline hypotensive and borderline bradycardic. You give that patient nitroglycerin, now you reduce preload even more you're gonna drop that patient like a hammer, which is why on the BLS side of the house, we tell our BLS providers, do not give nitroglycerin to a patient who has a systolic blood pressure of less than 90. So they could be having a right-sided MI, and you could drop them like a hammer, which is why you don't give nitrates to those patients. So for the ALS folk, about the only thing we can do in a straight up, no bullshit, uh, core pulmonale, right-sided heart failure, is fluids. And what we're trying to stimulate is called the Frank Starling's Law. And let me go ahead and pull this slide down here. Frank Starling's law tells us that the farther that we stretch myocardial fibers to a certain point, if we overstretch them, then they just fail. But the further we stretch myocardial fibers, the harder they snap back. I think about it like a rubber band. And right, so if you pull a rubber band a little bit and let it go, it doesn't do much. You pull that rubber band a good distance and let it go and snap back and hit your hand, it hurts. So the further we stretch myocardial fibers, the harder they're gonna come back. So the thought process in Frank Starling's law and right-sided heart failure or right-sided MIs is if we flood the system and we increase the end diastolic volume, right, the preload in the right ventricle, that right ventricle is going to expand further and snap back harder, thereby correcting the right-sided problem. Uh, not correcting it, putting a Band-Aid on it until we get into the hospital, increasing their blood pressure, increasing perfusion. Again, I've been doing this a long time. I think I've only seen that in practice once, maybe twice. Uh, it's not something that you typically do, but that's your difference between right and left-sided heart failure. Now, to go a little further down the rabbit hole with left-sided heart failure, we talked about cardiogenic shock in the last video. Your big difference between left-sided heart failure, acute pulmonary edema, 
and cardiogenic shock. Your pulmonary edema patient is going to be positional, sitting up, pouring with sweat, big JVD, rails, right? pulmonary edema. You can hear them gurgling. Their blood pressure is going to be through the roof. These are sick, sick patients. Your cardiogenic shock patients, on the other hand, are going to look like death. Right? They're going to be ashen gray, cool, pale, diaphoretic, shocky, sweating, full of rails. But they're going to be hypotensive. Right? They aren't going to be sitting up. They're going to be laid back, and they're going to be desperately trying to die on you. Um, about the only thing that we're going to be able to do for those patients, other than supportive care, right, oxygen positioning as best we can, uh, your, your basic uh, getting them to the appropriate facility, uh, but the only thing we can do for these patients, the ALS side of the house, is dopamine. Uh, so you know, 400 milligrams into a 250 cc bag, 1600 mic per cc concentration, if that's your standard pro, if that's your standard protocol, if you're even using dopamine, and then you can use the street rule. Right? Patient weighs 200 pounds. Right? Drop the last number, 20, subtract 2, 18. 18 drops a minute is giving you 5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. That's as scientific as it gets. 60 drops set, you roll that patient into the ER, and they'll put them on a pump and they'll do everything else. Uh, you're fighting an uphill battle. 85% of these patients are going to die. And it's just the way it is, unfortunately, if we don't, if they don't succumb to their injuries or to their ailment before we get to them first. All right. Um, so real quick, let me check my notes here and make sure. Okay. The only thing we really didn't talk about was CHF. And the reason I don't spend a lot of time on congestive heart failure is because it's not acute. Uh, to say somebody is having acute CHF it's like saying somebody has acute diabetes. It doesn't work that way. Uh, CHF is an element over time that's secondary to other concomitant medical conditions. So if they've had cardiac disease for years, now they have CHF. They had a heart attack, now they have CHF. So to say that somebody is having acute CHF is not accurate. They may be having acute pulmonary edema from exacerbation of CHF or from a new onset MI or something like that. That's not acute CHF. It just it, it doesn't sound right. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, if any, in, in this video. So just to recap, a lot of things we talked about. We talked about the assessment of the cardiac patient, uh, OPQRST, looking at your environment, looking at your surroundings, looking at your patient, listening to your patient and what they're telling you. Your patient may present classic. Your patient may present very vague and uh, just a couple of anginal equivalents and everything in between. Um, we talked about acute coronary syndromes, plaque buildup, uh, the treatment of that, whether it be aspirin or fibrinolytics, um, nitroglycerin, why we would give it. Uh, we talked about MI versus stable angina, and we really don't care, quite frankly. We talked about left versus right-sided heart failure. We talked about some of the treatments uh, on your left-sided patient. We talked about your treatments for your right side, but again, something we normally don't see or work with very often. And we talked a little bit about cardiogenic shock and CHF. So we hit on a lot of treatments and how your patient might present in the cardiac world. Ultimately, if you're a BLS provider and your gut is telling you my patient's having some sort of an acute coronary syndrome, call ALS or get them to the appropriate facility. Know what the appropriate facility is in your area. If you take them to the wrong place, you're not doing your patient any good. Uh, you're just clicking away on time. Now, there's, there are variables. You know, if you've got a, a decent local hospital five minutes away and your cardiac hospital is an hour away, all right, these are judgment calls, but that's all in medical planning. Um, that's pretty much it for what we wanted to cover today as far as treatments go. This is the tip of the iceberg again on, on cardiac care and a lot of the things uh, that are out there. But follow your local protocol, of course. Um, continue your education on uh, cardiac. It's just it's so many different things. In future videos, like I said, I'll probably do a, an ACLS review for my ALS folk, but it's good for the BLS folk to look at and uh, get a peek behind the curtain. Uh, we may do a little review on 12 lead EKG, uh, which is always nice to blow the dust off. But beyond that, we're going to continue on to medical topics, and I'll see what the next medical topic is going to be after this, and we'll, we'll move forward. For code word, uh, coffee. 
How about that? I don't think we did that one yet. Let's do coffee. All right, so if my FBI folk coffee is the code word for video 14, which is what we just finished, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you continue to enjoy it and continue to tune in. Uh, that's about it. Have a great day, everybody. Stay COVID-free. Be well. Thank you.